appreciate that. That was a first. <laughs> and pr praise God, I hope it's the last. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I was just about speechless. That's right. I was just like, oh my gosh. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's definitely been an experience uh, coming to Hilo, seeing the schizophrenic uh, weather. <laughs> First couple days, we were calling on Noah the second to <laughs> bring his ark, and then all of a sudden, sun came out. We hadn't seen Mauna Kea, so we saw it this morning coming in. I'm going, my gosh, there's mountains over there. <laughs> I had no clue. <laughs> and so it's, it's really, really been a kick to enjoy uh, all kinds of Hilo and, and the mosquitoes and uh, cockroaches and <laughs> wild goats and <laughs> yeah, but I, I do want to um, say a couple things about our trip here and uh, Sylvia's in 1000 percent agreement. Uh, the people that we've worked with have just been the absolute tops. And uh, we want to thank them for all the wonderful food that they've brought. The fact that I've been eating lunch when the rest of my life I never eat lunch. I've gained about six pounds. So I look about six months pregnant. <laughs> Just kidding. <coughs> Seven. Okay. So, but also... Um, Kevin and Kimmy have just been outstanding uh, in helping us and blessing us. I mean, from everything from printers to uh, a television so we could watch some CDs at night, which I got to admit I did, and uh, DVDs, excuse me, instead of working, I actually, yeah, we actually sat down and watched some things and silly movies, but really fun to kind of break out of the mold, you know. And uh, oh, Bethany has just been, wow. She is really one amazing uh, hostess and uh, sweet as can be. We've really enjoyed our evening talks with her and all. And just, I just also want to mention that uh, we are officially releasing um, Kevin and Kimmy as teammates with Freedom Encounters to begin praying for you all. They did an outstanding job. Um, and against some of the toughest critters and odds that are out there, and they hung in there and they did a great job and just kept getting better all week. And um, they're going to really bless a lot of you now in real special ways, just like they have those that they've uh, been praying for. and we've gotten to sit in and join in with. Darn, Kevin hasn't heard this. Oh, well, I'll let him know later. He's outside. <laughs> so also, we've just had a lot of benefits, even a chiropractic adjustment or two, which has really been a great blessing. Thank you, Greg, that's right. And uh, it's just been a really special time for us uh, here in Hilo, and neither one of us had been to this side of the island before, so that was a lot of fun to see that. And we'll get to see some more of it tomorrow on our way to the opposite side. So anyway, one of the things I want to share with you is that before we go to a location, and we're going to be teaching, preaching, whatever you end up calling it, I'm not quite sure, um, the Lord tells us what to do. We never have a clue. And I mean, it's really different every time. And this was no different. He, he said, this is what I would like you to share with that group. So what that always tells us is you have need, at least some of you, maybe not all of you, of course, but some of you have need for what he's given us to share. And both of us will be sharing today. We always do that. We always team teach, team preach, team everything because we're one flesh, okay? <clears throat> so 
if you have a Bible, you'll want to turn to 2 Corinthians 10. I'm going to read uh, verses 3 through 5. Now, most everyone in this room has heard this scripture before. But then the Lord gives us kind of a different slant on it than I had ever heard. And, and Sylvia, too, just a little different. Actually, in a way, it's a lot different. And so I want to share with you what he gave us on this. We'll also be going to a couple other scriptures as we go through the process. But this in particular is going to be the beginning. And what he asked us to share is different than I've ever taught or heard anywhere else. So in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, one of the things that I've recognized over the decades of being in this work, and by the way, it was 50 years ago, January, I did my first deliverance for somebody. It has been a honk a long time. I know you all thought I was 50. I'm sorry. <laughs> 1982? Yes, dear. You better be careful, you know. Oh, they don't know us. They don't know we do this with each other all the time. <clears throat> that was a joke. Okay. So, <laughs> but one of the things that I've recognized is that people in spiritual circles get into habits. They get into magic formulas at times. Okay, they will say a phrase, not even know what it means, but because they've heard somebody say it, or a pastor, or a leader, or just another friend, they just repeat it and think there's all this power in it. Okay? They get into a habit of repeating the same things over and over. Again, speaking them out as though they're magic. A magic formula. Well, we're going to talk about that. And kind of they have an attitude that no matter what, it's going to work. And then when it doesn't work, they wonder why. Okay. Here we are. You all here, Sylvia and me, everybody in this room, <clears throat> we're not here on earth to just take up space. That's not why we're here. We're supposed to be working. We don't want to develop some kind of to-do list of a bunch of wishes a bunch, of, a bunch of things that we hope are going to come true someday. That's not the purpose. Everyone here was chosen for this day and hour. Everyone was called and destined to be here at this point in time for the end days. And I got news for you. We are in the very end days. And you're here. So why, why weren't you here 800 years ago or 2,800 years ago? Why are you here now? It's because God has gifted you and called you with certain things, certain gifts, certain parts of that call designed to have you serve the kingdom of God for a specific purpose. Every single one of us. Okay. We have developed some of us habits of spiritual things that we do, or maybe not. And we have forgotten where the source of those habits were. And hopefully they were God himself. Hopefully we have godly habits. And the things I've heard about Hilo and learned about Hilo and the meth problem and all the other stuff, there is a need here that's really super galactically gigantic. I mean, it really is, amen? Isn't that true? See, so what Paul is speaking about here in 2 Corinthians 10, notice verse 3. The weapons 
that we have are not simply skill sets. They're not skill sets. They are not habitual phrases that we're supposed to memorize. That is not what's, what Paul's talking about. Listen. We don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are, are not carnal. They're not fleshly. If it was something that we just say a particular phrase and voila, some great magical thing happens. Wouldn't Paul have told us that? See, sometimes it's not so much what scripture says as what it doesn't say. He doesn't give magic formulas. He doesn't say just repeat this one thing and presto, everything's going to be good. He doesn't say that, does he? So, where exactly do we get these weapons of warfare that Paul is talking about? They all become empowered when we develop an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, so much of scripture, have you noticed, is very annoying, but in a lot of the Bible it says, if this, then that. But you know what? We focus on the that, then that, and we ignore the if because the if involves something that we have to do in order to get the then that. Well, <clears throat> you know what? That has to do with weapons of warfare also, gang. It does. If we don't have a relationship with him, how are those weapons of warfare going to work? How can they work? Unless it's just a magic formula, habitual phrase, just something I'm in the habit of doing. For example, I rebuke you, Satan. How many of you have ever heard that? Okay. Number one, Satan's not even around to hear you. He's got more important work to do. He's got really major characters he's in charge of controlling right now, do you think? He's not spending a whole lot of time in Hilo. Okay? Number one, that's, that's number one. Number two, I'm going to show you <laughs> Some of you have seen this on our, you know, one of our seminar tapes. But I'm going to show you what rebuking a demon looks like to a demon. And you tell me, is this going to scare that demon? Now, I have to set this down to show you. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, great. <laughs> great photo. That wasn't part of the photo op. How many of you were scared? You need prayer. First one on the list, Kevin, that guy right back there. <laughs> Let the record show, <clears throat> only one hand went up, another halfway because they thought that was what they were supposed to do. If it didn't scare you, tell me, is it going to scare a demon? That's what rebuking does. Whoopie do. Aren't you excited? So much authority and power in that. Not. Okay, that's my point, see. How about... Mm, well, there's others I'll share later. But, but I think that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. God is our source. Knowing him becomes our confidence and our boldness. It becomes the foundation for the authority that we have over the enemy. That's where it has to come from. How can you have that if you don't know him? See, there's a lot of people that say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm this and that, but I was born in America. Or I go to church every Sunday. Well, you know what? That doesn't make you any more Christian than sitting in a garage every day makes you a Ferrari. I mean, what's that got to do with anything? Okay? I mean, really. So how do any of us expect to pull down strongholds 
or cast down imaginations without power. Can't do it. We don't get the power by developing muscles at the gym. You don't get power out of just being religious. If there's no intimate relationship with Christ, or at least working towards that end, you don't build spiritual muscles. You actually get weaker. They atrophy. Some of you have been in bed with sickness or something for probably a lengthy period of time. When you then got up, you're like, wow, I cannot believe how weak my muscles have gotten in a week. You see, the point is what we have to actually know him personally, not know about him. That's totally different. I mean, tons of people that don't know Christ know about him, but that, what, what good is that? How does that help you? It doesn't. So in the scripture, what is pulling down a stronghold? Well, for that point, what is a stronghold? Everybody has a different idea as to what a, a stronghold is. But in, in the Greek, it means a mindset, a set of beliefs. And who has been helping set those beliefs? Don't we have two sides of the spectrum? We have the enemy trying to destroy your self-identity and tell you who you are. Remember last week I shared some of those lies? Is there anyone here who had not heard some of those lies before? Is there anyone here who never believed some of those lies before? Let the record show, no hands went up. Not mine either. See, we have all been lied to by the enemy since we were born. We've come to know their voices better than our parents, and we've believed that, and we, that has helped create a set of beliefs and a set mindset, and that's what a stronghold is. And he says we're supposed to, Paul says here, we're supposed to pull those strongholds down, cast down the imaginations that the enemy gives us. You can't do it without a knowledge and a relationship with him. It's, you don't get it by osmosis because you're sitting in that pew. I wish you could. I mean, make life a whole lot more simple for me. Would you all agree? Oh, that would be so sweet, Thornburg. Why can't we do that? Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't work that way. So these thoughts that we get help create belief. We can get it from the Word of God. We can get it from Kevin and others who are preaching from this pulpit. But during the week, you get hammered. Actually, usually the moment you leave the church because some of you get the first thought, well, that applies to everybody else, but not you. You're just not good enough. You don't measure up. You're a freaking failure. There's no way you're going to be able to do that. And you begin thinking that immediately, you buy into it because you've heard it 10,000 times before in your entire life. Well, these are the word curses that shape our identity. The enemy wants us to believe it so that it becomes a stronghold instead of a weak hold. Okay? That's what Paul's talking about here. God says to pull the stinking thinking down. So you just replace stronghold with stinking thinking because that's the source of all of these strongholds, every last one of them. So how on earth can we do that if we don't know him well enough? If we haven't received our true identity that he speaks about here, how on earth can we pull it down and use a weapon with his authority? How's it even possible, gang? I don't think we can. We have to know who we are and take that knowledge of our identity, the true thing, instead of the lies, and say, sucker, is that the best you got? Come on. 
I know who I am in Christ. You know, get out of here, you land, well, whatever, okay? <laughs> so we have to choose to learn and receive and believe and accept what he says about that true identity, don't we? If I don't feel worthy enough to remember that I've been given weapons, much less how to use them with authority because of those lies that the enemy has fed me my whole life, what good does it do to mouth some basically useless words? Are you catching what I'm trying to share? This is what God told us to share with you. Why? I don't know. It's his business. <laughs> but he knows you a lot better than we do. Okay? Now, another thing. Another example. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18, is scripture that many of you have read over and over. It's called the armor of God, the spiritual armor. Okay, is there anybody who's never read it or heard about it here? Okay. We all have. We're very aware of it. But there's particular spot verses I'd like to kind of refer to here. Ephesians 6, 10 through, let's see, 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Uh-oh, there's an if. And the power of his might, and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that what? You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Principalities, powers, rulers. By the way, a whole lot of other critters too. Okay, territorial and otherwise. Okay. And then it says, therefore, take up. Do you hear that? Take up the whole armor, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all to stand. You see, it's, it's a whole big thing about going through some more of those empty phrases. Well, God, I put on the whole armor of God. Okay, I'm fine for the day. And you couldn't even tell me what they are. You haven't got a clue. You haven't never studied it. You just say it. Because it sounds like another magic formula. And then when something bad happens, well, God didn't protect me. Excuse me? You see, this is what Paul's giving at. And he's getting at it here in Ephesians. Maybe you have it hanging on the wall. Just looking at it once in a blue moon going, oh, that armor, that looks pretty cool. But I don't want to put it on because it's heavy. Putting on these part of the armor that points to the power and authority of Christ in our battles. How many have actually put the armor on to Christ? Now this is a totally different idea. On to him. You see, he is our armor. He is what helps us overcome those strongholds. It's all on him, not us. If we don't know him, we're putting empty shells and boots and everything else on our body and belts and whatever, swords, etc. See, they don't matter then. How can, we, how can we determine if we understand it and have put it on to him by asking ourselves, do I have a sense of my righteousness in him? Or has the enemy got you focusing on all the negative things that you've done in your life instead? You are the righteousness of Christ. Doesn't matter if you believe it or not, you are if you've accepted him as your savior. That's just the way it is, get over it. You're the righteousness of Christ, you get it? You can't lose it. You go out and do some stupid idiot thing here in Hilo, guess what? You're still the righteousness of Christ. You just slipped a bit, okay? So he took all our sin, and we receive his righteousness. That's the great exchange. He alone is right, however. 
The Bible says we've been made that. Now, next question, do I truly know his peace or does that peace seem elusive? Hard to grab, hard to get a hold of. Is it off to the side? Do I think I'm a Christian? Again, because I'm born in America and I go to church, and so therefore I should have peace all the time, or is it something that I made a decision about from my heart? Which is it? Um, have I used the sword of the Spirit that it talks about in battle? Because I know the power of his word. Not just because I have this Bible sitting at home. But I never open it, never look at it. I haven't got a clue what it says in it. But it looks nice, just like that armor that's hanging on the wall. It's kind of attractive. And then all hell breaks loose, and I'm like, what happened? Get a clue. You see, when I say God's words by faith, the angels bring them to pass. Psalm 103, 20 says, Bless the Lord, you as angels who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Well, just who is the word? The same one that we place the armor on because we're taking him up onto our lives. Gang, these just aren't lighthearted questions. All warfare and the use of the armor of God comes from knowing him. All of it. Especially when we consider the difficult situations going on in this world right now. The pandemic only being one of a few thousand. It's knowing what is bestowed upon us in the new birth that gives us that eternalized spirit that is taken into ourselves. Again, it's not putting on the armor with rote words. It's receiving the power of each piece as we put it on. Taking it up by faith, using it in authority, and then Paul says here, having done all to stand, stand. In other words, he's saying, you just don't stand once. You want to be standing firm 24-7. Anything that idiot throws at you, idiot being the enemy, you just want it to bounce off and say, is that the best shot you can give me, sucker? Don't you, don't you see you're trying to penetrate the righteousness of Christ? Hello? You know, and, they're, and those demons are out there going, oh, crud. This dork knows who he is. This is really going to be a hard job. <laughs> And we say in Idaho for amen, Yahoo! Okay? Okay. Verse 13. Yeah, we read verse 13. You know, soldiers had the armor because they were to use it for defensive and offensive purposes. It isn't just to overcome what they're throwing. It's to get back at them. That's why we don't rebuke demons. We burn them up with the fire of the Holy Spirit. I really love it if all of you would change your language right now. Just say, Holy Spirit, toast those demons. Just toast them. That's Ken's words. Okay. Trust me, Holy Spirit knows exactly what you're asking. He's, I've really built a habit into him to recognize that word. <laughs> okay. Now, the final result is what we read in Daniel 11.32. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. That's what our God means for us today. Carry out those great exploits. And folks, you need a lot of great exploits going on in Hilo and all the towns around here. Now, one last thing I want to share with you. It wasn't on the list until 2 o'clock this morning. I get awakened. I'm thinking I have to go to the bathroom. Well, somebody starts sharing something with me to share with you <laughs> at the end of our time, my time, before I turn it over to Sylvia. How many of you are not familiar with Spider-Man? Is there anybody who hasn't got a clue who Spider-Man is? Oh, thank God. Okay. So here's the, here's the thing. 
The guy under the Spider-Man suit, his name was Peter Parker, right? He was a real weasel. Would you agree? I mean, he didn't turn any girls' heads. He was small and frail and kind of not exactly a Chippendale hunk. Amen? If there's any girls that think he was a Chippendale hunk, I'll pray for you after the service right up here. Okay. <laughs> there's a reason I'm saying this. So Peter Parker, <laughs> he's, and he's got all these dreams and everything. I mean, he's a nice guy. He's kind of a geek, you know, one of those type of fellas. And the moment he puts on the Spider-Man suit, he's totally transformed. He becomes the hero of the day. He jumps, leaps tall buildings in a single bound, faster than a speeding bullet, you know, the old Superman thing. I mean, he's better than Superman. So, I mean, this guy saves the day and yada, yada, yada. You, you understand what I'm saying? He's a different character when he puts this on. Well, the Lord says to me, well, I'm just barely awake at 2 in the morning going, why am I awake? I'm supposed to be sleeping tonight. <laughs> it would be nice. And he says, Ken, it's the same thing that you're sharing with the group. You see, when we place that armor and that righteousness and everything over us like that suit that Spider-Man has, we become transformed into his likeness. We walk and carry the authority. We carry everything then in our hand. Everything that he has given us is there. <clears throat> and we might be weak and maybe not the most handsome person in the world here, okay? Jesus created you and he doesn't make trash. He created you for this day and hour. He doesn't care how gorgeous you are or handsome or lack thereof. Thank goodness. You know, he cares about what's in here. And if you know him, then you are placing that Spider-Man suit, okay, down over you. And as you do, you are fully transformed to destroy strongholds, to stand and withstand, and to do great exploits, as these three scriptures he gave us for you state. I, when he, as he's telling me this, I'm praying this over myself at 2.15 in the morning. I'm going, man, it's good enough for them. I'm going to start right now. And I'm like, yeah, I need that too. I need it just as much as anybody is going to be there in the morning. That is really the summary statement for everything that I just shared. See yourself as a Spider-Man, Spider-Woman, Spider-whatever it is with that suit coming down, transforming you into the image and likeness of God. With the same authority, the same power, the same level of faith, the same everything. I just, I was so appreciative that he shared that with me because it really was a complete summary of these scriptures for you. And I'll turn it over to my good looking half and sit down, yeah. Good job, babe. When I married Ken, which was a total shock that I would ever marry again, and I came to live with him and join him because God then retired me from what I was doing. Okay, I, I, God retired me from what I was doing. And I would think we started to go to Holland, then Germany, then Belgium, then France, then all these places, and I would think the thoughts I was getting, why are you spending the people's money? <coughs> why are you going? This is the Ken Thornburg show, as you have seen. He was special, anointed. He'd been walking in this all this time, and i am been over here in a whole nother world that I had no grid for any of this stuff. 
but God. And when I would get those thoughts of, you shouldn't go, you have no reason to go, there's nothing you're going to do, so stay home and save some money. I would start to say those thoughts to Ken, and he would go, what? What? You're crazy. Of course you're coming. And I'd go, but seriously, I don't have anything to do. I don't want to do, I don't want to go just to go, you know? I'd really rather stay home in my own bed with my own pillow. <laughs> just saying. <clears throat> but when that began to happen, the Lord let Ken know that the minute that started coming out of my mouth, the opposite was true. Who was telling me to stay home? Duh, right? So I just use a very practical way of sharing with you how sneaky the enemy is with the thoughts. And this whole service has been about thoughts. Do you believe that you are who I say you are? Or do you believe what you've been told in your mind your whole life, that all those you statements that come in when we're conceived? So really, when we go to school and we learn a subject, we're being programmed about that subject, aren't we? And we take it on. Well, the enemy knows that, and he's been teaching us to believe things that are contrary to who the I am says that I am. And this is what God is always doing, and we have to understand that this is the battle. You know, Joyce Myers and others, the battlefield is the mind. What we believe and what we believe in our hearts if we believe we are nothing and can't do anything and God doesn't love us, all of that, how then do we feel? Do we feel good? Part of what I've seen is the greatest power of this ministry. We, we stopped on the way this morning. We took out the garbage. I really like the garbage collectors, don't you? Because it stinks otherwise if we don't take it out. Bad thoughts, lying thoughts are the same. So every day, we are learning more and more to be conscious. How can we take a thought captive <laughs> if we don't register what we've been thinking? So the Lord just told me this simple thing. I'm, I'm making dinner. I'm just doing regular everyday things. I'm fine. I'm fine. And suddenly, in about a half an hour, I'm not fine. And the Lord said, <clears throat> Back up the tapes. You know those old cassette tapes? You'd run them, click, run them, click. Back up the tapes. And I'd back up, and I would hear the same old thing. Nobody cares about you. Your husband doesn't appreciate you. You just get the grunt work to do. You know, why do you have to have all this happen? Blah, 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 blah. And it was back here, you guys. It's back here. And it's the same old thing that we hear, but it doesn't come up front that we catch it. You know, we're just reacting sometimes with pain or anger or something. We don't even have time to take a thought. It's grooved in our gut. And those are called triggers. And later we go, God, I just lost my temper. Well, that is sin. So the Lord's taught us, just come to the garbage dump. Lord, that is sin. I lost my temper. I was impatient again. That's sin. And I thank you that when I confess that, you lift it off of me. Oh, I can't tell you how many years I lived with anger that I didn't know was there. And it would just come out at the most inopportune times because I was triggered with old stuff and my emotions were not healed. And so this is true for all of us. We're all trying to keep control and everything else when, in fact, God wants to take the garbage out. So you just take the garbage out, and it is a great exchange. You just say, Lord, I give you that anger. I give you that impatience. And I say, that's not who I am. And I think of the big capital, I am, because that's who lives in me. And I just wanted to share that with you. It's so simple. Just go to the garbage dump. Jesus has the most infinite garbage bag. It is infinite. And if we just go and put the garbage in the bag, we have got now a vacuum in us, don't we? We give him anger and resentment and bitterness and pain and heartache, and those are just a few, <coughs> shame. Then what do we want in its place? What do you want? 
the opposite? You know, if you're angry, don't you want to be peaceful and joyful? So just take this one thing. If you don't hear anything else from Thornburgs, take this one thing. Take out the garbage every day. Say, Lord, what garbage am I carrying around? Because my heart's hurting and I just feel crummy. I'd rather stay in bed. When you feel that way, there's unfinished business and there's garbage that's got to go. Amen? Amen? So I want you all to think right now, God, what's the number one thing to put in the trash? I want you to think about it. Every one of you. Every one of you. And Jesus is right in front of you. And just say, Jesus, I give you this fill in the blank. Today, I just, I go to the garbage dump. <laughs> Jesus, thank you. And I would like to have in its place and be greedy. This is where you get to be greedy. You go to God and say, I just want this and this and this and this and this. Okay? Now, that's not enough. Guess what? If somebody gives you a present, which somebody did for us this morning, they, gave, they handed a bag of goodies. Did I let, I'd say, oh, thank you for that gift. What did I do? I said, yeah, I took it. I took it. This is one of the other things. It says, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have what you've prayed. So if you just say, oh, God, I need patience. Oh, God, I need this. Oh, God, I need that. And you never say, thank you, Lord. I give you impatience, and I take patience. Yes. And you receive it. I, I tell people, I take that. I have it. It's mine. Yes. And it's now who I am. Yes. And it's a daily walk. Are we perfect? No. Nah. No. Of course not. I just want to say, when I walked into this lovely church, I just felt the presence of the Lord. You all are worshiping, loving Jesus people. And I want you to look around at all the empty potential places. There's coming a day, says the Lord, that you will have to go to more service than one. And every seat in these pews will be occupied because I am fixing my fixing to bring in the people who are brokenhearted, who are addicts, who are cast down, cast out, never knew who they were, and you will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. And it is that presence, that spirit, that light within each of you that will draw them. And they'll come and say, you look so joyful, <laughs> like my brother in the back. He just drew me with his heart of joy. I went and sat up and said, who are you? <laughs> okay, they're going to be drawn because they're going to see the light of the love of God. Now, when I sat here last week, I looked at this beautiful church and I kept looking at these pipes. And I started getting a word for you <laughs> about these pipes. I mean, at one time, can you imagine how that organ sounded? It blasted this whole place. I bet. I bet they could hear it for several blocks out, right? Right. Well, the <laughs> there's 22 on this side and 22 on that side, and I'm looking, and they're all sizes and shapes. And the Lord said for me to tell you that those that he has brought to be planted in the foundation of this house, those are representative of you because there's going to come a sound from this house, from the people who know their Lord, who are ready to do exploits. The exploits, you guys, it's the miracle of receiving Jesus first and foremost. That's the most precious miracle of all. But we just don't understand it. That's why we must know him. We must know him. But those pipes in you, in your worship, and in your love of God, as you continue forward, just getting rid of the trash, I decrease and he increases. Because the Bible says, arise and shine for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen on you. 
and people will come to your light. It isn't in heaven. It's here. And this is why we are here for such a time as this. Now, the last thing I want to share is this. I'm af- I am, have been afraid that I will fail Jesus. I mean, the thought of being captured, being tortured, being put in concentration camps, whatever it is, I've been afraid. Jesus, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not going to stand. I've had a very easy and blessed life, haven't we all? And I, I would say that to him regularly. I'd try to put it in his trash bag, and he just said, sweetheart, it's really simple. Where was Stephen looking when he was being stoned? He was looking up, and he saw Jesus stand up from his seated position to greet him. And he said, it's so simple. The issue is, where is your focus? All of the thoughts that are enemy thoughts that have ch- has trained us up to believe things about ourselves has our focus this way. I can't do it. I shouldn't go. I can't do that. I can't do that. I am not that. Blah, blah, blah. And he said, if you will change your focus to just agree with me that you are who I say you are, unique thumbprint, unique eye print, no one like us, because he in us is unique, priceless, treasure. I said, Jesus, I like to think of Jesus of Nazareth being over here. After the cross, he's Jesus, glorified king. So I'm saying, Jesus, how did you do it? How did you do it? Because, I mean, all of us have these vows we make, like on January, I'm going to lose five pounds, and in an hour we're gaining three. How did you keep your face like flint, as it says. And he said, read how it was for me in the garden. I was one on one with my father. I said, can't you just pray with me and be with me? And they all slept. He said, I was able because of his grace, of course. I did it for you. I did it for you because he loves you. But most of all, I did it because I love him. I love my dad. You see, Jesus of Nazareth had no way of knowing what he believed was true until he got to the other side. Isn't that true? All the things that the father had him prophesy about himself, He trusted in God that he would deliver him, but he did not know. He did not know. But it was because of his relationship with the Father that the word of God that had been law all the way through the Old Testament became not the logos of the law, but the rhema of the spoken word. The reason we share He said, the Lord said to us, there's the mind of the matter and there's the heart of the matter. And I get to bring the heart of the matter because the heart of the matter is that God himself saw and knew the end from the beginning and he knew that there was nobody to rescue but himself because he started it all. The father said to me, how do I know How do I know? How do I know that I am love unless I test my own heart? And through his creation and him wanting to say, get out of my way, I'm going to just fry him and then I'll make a new family out of you, he felt it. But his being... The love of his being is poured forth in the actual walk of the Son. 
And the Father that Jesus brought to all of us is the heart of the Father, the heart of God. The law was there, and God likes a balanced weight. The love and mercy and grace of God and the holiness. We can't have greasy grace. We can't be greasy grace that God's just going to forgive me. I can keep doing what I want to do. You will not, I will not be transformed into his image, which is where the power is. So I say to you, dear people, God is here. I know he's here. You know why? In the worship, I just want to weep because his presence is here. You are gifted. You are called. You are anointed, just like Jesus said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's chosen me, anointed me to preach good news to the captives. And you have the, all the captives of this place who are crying out for the King of Kings. And they're going to come. They're going to come. And these pipes that you are are going to be trumpeting to draw them in. So get to know the king of glory because there's nothing more fun than sitting just saying a few words and a touch and a hug and watching people's lives change. That's the power of God, the glory of God. Amen. Did you, did you do the exchange? Okay, you got the good stuff? Oh, good. You can go out of here changed. Thank you, you guys. We are so happy to be with you. You're a blessing. Amen.